I'm Dennis Dunaway. You're listening to Metal from the Inside. You've tuned in to the most crazy rocking metal podcast on the air. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Metal from the Inside. everybody to the metal from the inside podcast i am super excited about my next guest because if you know me you guys know just how much i love alice cooper and the alice cooper group and i'm joined by the one and only dennis dunaway the original bass player for the alice cooper band uh played on some of my favorite records uh billion dollar babies Love It to Death, which I got up here, a um, bunch of different records, and he is quite simply a legend. So thank you so much for taking the time to join me on the podcast. It's so great to have you. Oh, sure. Thanks, Cindy. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Uh, so I always like to start my interviews out uh, now just because of the current kind of weird world and climate we're in with just how are you and how are you doing? How has this time been? Because it's been crazy for all of us. It's kind of put us all in a weird position. Our lives are kind of on hold. So how have you been uh, in, in just the craziness of the last year? Uh, well, we're all fine here. We've been homebound since uh, last March. Uh, Cindy and I were, uh, my wife Cindy and I were in England for uh, the Manchester Film Festival and uh, for, the, for the film uh, Live from the AstroTurf. Alice Cooper that, that was filmed in Dallas. But we got there and the day after we arrived, all of a sudden COVID hit England and the uh, festival, our film was one of the only ones that, that showed. Uh, but a lot of Alice Cooper fans showed up regardless. And then we went to Liverpool and Cindy and I stayed in the John Lennon suite with a white baby grand piano and everything. And wow. <laughs> and so, so this year hasn't been uh, you know, it seems like five years ago that that happened, but it was actually, you know, uh, the beginning of last year. So since then, we've been at home, but we had, we, we locked down after having uh, a great trip and everything. You know, like most musicians, I'm just shifting gears and writing songs and recording demos and, and uh, doing interviews to help promote Alice's album and Cindy is creative, so and our daughter is creative. She lives here as well. Uh, so we all, you know, tend to just go off in our own room and do our thing, and then we get together, and and it's all good. Plus, we also uh, don't have uh, any uh, boredom going on around here because we rescued two puppies that are eight months old now. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> so things are hopping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just got a puppy um, like two weeks ago, and it's been insanity. Yeah, there's no boredom with a new puppy. There's <laughs> that's right, <laughs> no boredom. Um, that's but right. Yeah, it's uh, it's felt like it's been like you said, like five years, and it's crazy. I was just talking to somebody about you know the last concert I went to was you know a year ago this month, which is insane to think that it's already been a year. You know, and I can't even imagine what it's been like for you guys. You know playing and you know doing events and everything like that but you mentioned Alice's new album which I know that you are in the middle of promoting and everything which is so great I know that he just uh you guys just released the song uh Social Debris which is so great I kind of loved Alice's explanation as to what that is and what it meant for you guys so uh what is it like you know kind of still working with Alice and working on this album together I mean I know that you know you've you've written with Alice again over the years on his most recent records and have been a part of it and uh this that song is probably extra special to you guys because of you know the the role that Detroit played in in Alice Cooper's career. Oh yeah, Detroit was definitely a big deal for us because I'm 18 broke uh, from CKLW in Canada, which is right across the river from Detroit, and uh, you know, and we wrote the Love It to Death album and the Killer album in Pontiac, just outside of Detroit, but. As far as working with Alice, it's kind of like we've been friends for so many years that it's kind of like always just a continuation. It's not like getting back together. In fact, I have an exclusive for you if you have a second here. I just, I ran across something that's very rare. It's a letter that Alice wrote to me in 1964. Oh yeah. my gosh. And, and I don't know if you can see this, but he drew a little picture of himself on the back here. Uh, yeah, see, there he is. 
man. And, and uh, I was in Oregon. Uh, oh, yeah, he, he sent it to Mr. E. Wig because we were the earwigs. And then in the letter, he's basically talking about, because I was in Oregon on my grandpa's farm working to get money to buy my first base. And so in the letter, he's, he's talking about which Beatles songs he wants us to learn when I get back and learn how to play. <laughs> oh my gosh. It is, that is so crazy that you still have so many of those letters. Because I mean, I've seen you, you've posted other ones as well over the years, you know, on, on social media and everything. That's so great. <laughs> well, this... This is the earliest one that I've found. You know, when it comes to the uh, Detroit experience and everything, you know, the Alice Cooper group were traveling a lot then. We kind of landed in Detroit because uh, uh, we got a booking agency there with Leo Fenn, who became our road manager at the time. Uh, Leo was married to Patty Quattro. Their daughter was Cheryl Lynn Fenn, the actress. But uh, Leo would drive, uh, jump us, uh, put us in the station wagon and drive us all over Kingdom Come. But most of our gigs were in the Midwest. So all of a sudden, this uh, Hollywood band all of a sudden became a Detroit band and had to, uh, well, didn't have to uh, conform to more of what uh, the Midwest wanted, which was, you know, fist in the air all the time kind of stuff. Uh, you know, we gladly, you know, got all absorbed in that uh, scene. It was, you know, it was exciting. It was hard rock. It was, you know, and they had their own lingo. You know, most of the people that we knew had worked building cars at one point or another, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, uh, you know, and, and we had this farmhouse where we could rehearse 10 hours a day and lots of musicians would come over and we'd go over to their place, the Stooges and the, well, uh, Mitch Ryder came over a lot and we would get out the acoustic guitars and, and jam until, you know, three or four in the morning. And he was usually the last guy to pack it in. He'd love jamming and trying to come up with new songs. So, you know, a lot of stuff like that going on, but, uh, you know, everything was always interrupted by a string of gigs, you know, because we had to keep, we had to do as many gigs as we possibly could because, uh, you know, because we didn't get paid that much. We didn't have a hit single, which is why Bob Ezrin was brought in. And that's, that's how he helped us the most with uh, I'm 18. Yeah. So that, when you guys heard that song on the radio for the first time, it was in Detroit. There are different memories, depending who you talk to. Michael remembers the first time was we were driving down the road in the station wagon and it came on the radio and we pulled over and we we're all jumping up and down. But I remember uh, the first time hearing it. We had a little, just a little radio in the living room at the Pontiac Farm. And uh, we always had it tuned in to CKLW and, and the song came on and and, uh, you know, I'm yelling up the stairs, Neil, get down here, you know, and all that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and the phone was ringing, you know, Leo Finn, hey, are you listening? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and it was very exciting, you know, and then it turned into us arguing about who was responsible. Like, uh, you know, if it weren't for my bass playing, it never would have become a hit, you know, <laughs> and that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, now for Social Debris, this was, if... I'm not 100% uh, sure, so I wanted to ask, was this a song that you guys had written earlier or was this a song that you have written recently? Was this like a, a, um, a deep th cut or something like that? Uh, no, this, this was, uh, Neil wrote this song and I'm not sure how long ago. I know he, uh, the first time I heard it was uh, around the time of the Paranormal album because that gotcha. was one of the songs that... Uh, that was submitted or that we were all kicking around, you know, but uh, you know, a song doesn't have to be written exactly at the time that it's about for it to be clear in it's the, you know, the emotion and everything, you know, Neil's a great songwriter. So, you know, I got a hold of the demo and they kind of had, it kind of had been forgotten a little bit. And then I added a bass part and then I had a friend of mine, Nick Didkowski uh, play guitar part. And then we, we resubmitted it to for this album because the theme fit much better to Detroit. So when it came to, you know, recording this song, was this recorded pre-pandemic? 
is, you know, I mean, I know that it's really hard, you know, obviously with Alice's touring schedule and you guys are all in different locations, the days of often getting sometimes in the same room is slim to none sometimes. So did you guys record this pre-pandemic, you know, uh, together, not together, kind of, how did you guys go? No, we, this was pre-pandemic. We were out in Phoenix uh, for uh, the Christmas pudding show. Gotcha. Uh, not, not last December, but the December before that. We, where we did the show, the benefit, you know, where Joe Bonamassa and Johnny Depp joined us on stage. We went out a couple of days early and then Michael and Neil and I uh, worked up the song. And plus, I Hate You, which was the song that I brought to the table. And we recorded both of the songs the day before the Christmas pudding uh, show. Yeah, so it was no mask, nobody... I mean, nobody was even, we, we may have heard something about some virus in China by then, but. It was far it, away then. Yeah. December yeah. was like, oh, it's not, it's not coming here. It's in, <laughs> it's yeah. far away. It's thousands of miles away. But uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's cool that you guys still get together and, and record and everything. I mean, I know that you said when you write with uh, the rest of the band and with Alice, it kind of feels like a continuation, but when you guys get together does it yeah bring you back to i guess that time when you guys were all working together and, and writing those original albums well yeah i mean we we will talk about glenn buxton a lot yeah. you know because he's got all the stories and he's the one that's missing so kind of i think we talk about glenn a lot uh because that kind of helps him be a part of it you know his spirit is always there but uh yeah you know it's Recording techniques have changed, but we're all up on that, you know, and Bob Ezrin was there. So that, that's another similarity to uh, the Detroit days. Uh, but, you know, you go in and where in the old days, actually, let me say the vintage days. I like that better. In the vin vintage days, uh, you know, if I, especially when Jack Richardson was working with us, uh, with Bob Ezrin on Love It to Death and Killer. He was a bass player. And so if I had one little note in a song that I had just recorded that I think I could have done better, he would make me record the entire song again. He wouldn't punch in just for that note. Well, see, uh, well, Bob Ezrin would wait. Well, Jack's going to the bathroom. Let's punch in that note while he's gone, you know? <laughs> but, uh, but see, in today's uh, technology, of course, you can do all kinds of editing, even though uh, we're pretty conservative. We try to, uh, the re one reason we still can get it to sound kind of like the, uh, the Love It to Death era is because we don't edit the life out of it. You know, there's a tendency for some musicians to make everything perfect, and then all of a sudden it becomes too mechanical. It, it loses emotion. Well, you know, we we will edit certain things that really need to be done and the rest of it we just let it be as live as as possible. You know, and the and the most fun about it, you know, we get to the studio and you know, Alice shows up uh a little bit late because he had been golfing, of course. And uh you know, and then he just sits down on the couch and then we hand him the lyrics. And then he starts uh, looking over the lyrics and changing words here and there. And, uh, you know, and it's like, well, Alice is sitting over there doing that and we're doing this. It's not like everybody, oh, wow, we're back together again. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it really is just like, okay, well, we, we all know each other inside out. You know, <clears throat> we could blackmail each other a thousand times over. But uh, so then Bob Ezrin is there and he's always very positive, you know, and get to work and let's, let's get this going. Um, but the thing that's uh, the most satisfying, I think, that really brings it together is that as soon as we start playing, it's Neil, it's Michael. It, it just sounds like us whether we want it to or not, you know, and that's the part that really floods back and really... Uh, it's very satisfying. You know, Neil's the best drummer in the world, if you ask me. Uh, we lock in, you know, we're, I know what he's going to do. He knows what I'm going to do, even after these gaps in time where we haven't been in the same room. But we did it for so many years that, uh, you know, we, we work as a unit, you know, and uh, when he does a bass drum part, you know, my bass part goes with it, or we change one or the other until they lock in. You know, that's, a, that's how 
that's what makes a song uh, have the power that we like to get. You know, and Social Debris had uh, some parts. Uh, there were some parts that I had written that uh, I had wished they had made the final recording. You know, some real fancy licks, which are probably more showing off than anything than they needed to be. But we didn't know for sure what the vocals were going to do. So right. then I went, I went more conservative. So there's, there's always things like that that happen, no matter how much you rehearse. When you get in the studio, you have to be ready to roll with the punches and, and to uh, alter things right on, on the spot. Uh, and, and we did that with that song, you know, and we walk out that day and, and then we, uh, we go over to the, the theater to rehearse for the, the pudding show, which, you know, so it was all just kind of one really exciting, uh, I guess I was out there for about a week and every day was exciting. Yeah, I mean, I, you're talking about that and the chemistry, of course, you know, still, still must be there, like you were mentioning. I mean, you guys have spent so much time together. You've written so much music together. You've played together for, you know, so long that, yeah, it only makes sense that when you guys do come back and, and work together, that that's still palpable, you know? Uh, yeah. And, you know, we, uh, and on stage, is, that's a different thing, you know. Uh, people that are musicians, you know, well, not all musicians write their own songs, but uh, generally, you know, songwriting is something. Uh, recording is a whole different animal and uh, more, more different than, than you would think, I think, uh, most people. Uh, and then, uh, playing live, that's a whole different animal. So all three of those things are three different elements that whenever we do those together, uh, you know, it's, it's always, it's never the same. It's never like a cookie cutter thing, even though we might play the songs and on I'm 18, I might do my kick at a certain time, you know, uh, it's still, there's a lot of things going on that uh, vary and you have to stay on your toes. For instance, when we played uh, uh, with Alice and his touring band in 2017. We did the British tour. And on the first night, which was in Leeds, I came off stage and, and then I, you know, I went out to say hi to fans and stuff. And they're like, wow, how did you work that out with Alice with the crutch? I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, well, well, Alice, when he threw the crutch up over his head, back behind him, and you ducked just the, just in time, and it didn't hit you in the head. I'm like, I didn't even know that happened, you know. <laughs> and, and so we're on the tour bus with, uh, you know, Neil and Michael and Tommy Henriksen and the the whole gang, you know, Nita and all of them. And so I told them the story, and then that turned into everybody that has ever worked with Alice that was there started showing their stage scars. <laughs> and Alice says, you know, well, three things, you know, you will, you, will, uh, you will work hard, you know, it will be exciting, and you will get stitches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it only seems natural, right, in an Alice Cooper show. There's so much going on. It's, it's bound to happen sometimes. So. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the last time that happened, because from then on, on that part of 18, I was not anywhere near behind him. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to get me this time. I missed it. I'm not going to let it get me this time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, something that I've wondered for uh, a little bit now, and this is a story that actually is a question for you, but also involves me in a weird way, and I'm going to explain. Um, so I saw Alice back in 2017. Uh, he was doing the Deep Purple tour, obviously, you know, touring with his current band. And uh, I, I know uh, Tommy very well and Kyler very well, um, kind of just over the years and everything. So um, they'd given me some comp tickets for that show or whatever. And you probably don't remember, but it, you know, you uh, were in kind of the same row and Jimmy Webb was there. And it's so interesting because I did get to see you. I said, hi, I got to, uh, you know, say hello to you and everything. But, you know, you see these shows and I know that you go see Alice, you know, often when he's in town, you know, you go say hi and, you know, sometimes you come up on stage and play I'm 18 and, and uh, you know, some songs, especially when you were doing these most recent tours, like you mentioned. Uh, but for you, when you're in the audience, because ever since that, that show, I've always been curious, you know, when you're in the audience and you're watching these songs, you know, that you helped, you know, write and, you know, record and, you know, mean a lot to you. Does it feel weird to, to watch them kind of happen in front of you? Or, you know, is it something that, uh, 
not that you have any animosity or anything, but just it does it feel like weird to to watch that sometimes when you're in the audience? Well, it's typical for an entertainer in the audience to be thinking, I should be up there. <laughs> you know, that's sta that's standard. I'm not I'm not too bad that way. Um, you know, at first, you know, say welcome to my nightmare and stuff. Then it, it was kind of disturbing. In fact, I wrote a song about it. I wrote a song right after one of the first times I saw other people doing, you know, our thing uh, called Friend. And uh, it will be, uh, the demo of Friend is on a 12-inch vinyl record that is being pressed now wow. that will be going out to the Kickstarter people that all were so kind to donate money for me to make Cold Cold Coffin film. And it's taken me a long time. These uh, demos all got lost and almost, uh, and the tapes were disintegrated and all kinds of things. But I managed to get uh, 10 songs and one of them is Friend. And it's basically, it's talking about how, you know, especially when Neil and I would be in the audience and people around us, younger fans wouldn't even know who we were, right? Yeah. So, so we could really just be an audience member, you know, uh, it's exciting. You know, Alice's, uh, uh, current touring band are all, uh, they play the songs differently than we did, you know, pretty, they, they do a good job, but, uh, but you know, it's, uh, they make it their own, you know, and I, and, you know, I watch the show and of course, you know, if I had a clipboard, I would be, you know, writing things down about what, you know, uh, mostly, mostly I think, uh, and I do this with any band that I watch in my head, I'm thinking about how I could make it better and how that could, that should do that instead right. of that and all that. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a lot of that going on, but on the other, the flip side of the coin, you know, I'm thinking, you know, we wrote those songs 50 years ago. And here, there is still a room, a whole big giant arena full of people that are singing along with it, you know? Yeah. So, so I, I sit there and I feel proud too. Yeah. And I can imagine, I mean, it, yeah, it's my first impression was like, it must be, it must be weird to kind of see that, that happening in front of you. But I mean, how long do you think, cause I know, after, uh, you know, kind of the initial split happened. And, and, you know, like you mentioned back, back when you originally saw those songs being played, it, you know, kind of maybe struck a nerve in you. You know, how long do you think it took you to kind of, you know, leave that mindset and, and go into a mindset of, you know, I am proud that, that this is happening and that these songs are still being played? Because, I mean, obviously time kind of changes those things and, and uh, you know, getting older or, you know, life experience. So for you, you know, how long do you think maybe it took you to kind of reach that that point well right after the initial uh breakup which which i think the uh, the original band members were the last to know about really because i think we were kind of being kept on hold in case uh people rejected alice as a solo artist or in case the record company rejected alice as whatever so uh you know we thought that the battle axe album was going to be the next alice cooper album so, uh, but then after that, um, you know, we sunk so much money into that gigantic stage, you know, and meanwhile, we're reading about how we refuse to do theatrics. We're like, what? <laughs> we're building this gigantic stage with hydraulics and everything with a boxing ring that comes out from under the drum riser and all of that. And we're reading interviews saying that we refuse to do theatrics. What? Uh, but anyway, uh, when when it came down to it being us stranded without Alice, then we had this gigantic show and we couldn't headline because Alice wasn't with us and and, and nobody would have us let us open for them. So, uh, you know, there was a dark period. There was a dark period where I'd sit in a dark room and kind of pout and be, you know, grouchy and everything. And but, you know, I have Cindy. Uh, Cindy's, you know, she'd come in and kick me in the butt and tell me to snap out of it, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, like uh, Moonstruck, snap out of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so what I did is I, I was 
I was bitter about friendships, you know, Shep and Alice, I thought were my best friends. How could they do this? And I was bitter about the fans, you know, kind of letting it just happen without saying much, you know, and then what in my, in my opinion, and then nobody ever calling us to find out, you know, do an interview with us, say, what do you mean? We don't want to do theatrics. Yeah. Uh, and then also the music business, our record company bailed on us. So, so I was, I was bitter about the music business and I decided, okay, I'm, I'm not going to go into New York city. And, and, uh, if I do, if I go, go to see a band, I'm going to hide out in the darkest corner and I do not want anybody to call me up or point me out or anything. And, and I'm going to, uh, just go in my basement and I'm going to write songs and I'm going to get back to loving music for like like in the early days before all of this went down so that's what i did i wrote like a couple of hundred songs and some of them are uh, in fact even uh, i hate you is one of those songs which you can hear the anger in that song even though yeah. you know we we turned it into a tongue in cheek song originally it wasn't i hate you about anybody in particular it was just a song the original lyrics were basically the concept was dennis punk away you know i wanted to do some punk songs right and the premise of the lyrics at that point were somebody that hates somebody else nobody in particular and then uh putting them down with ridiculous reasons, you know, like, uh, you know, your perfume smells like a gas station bathroom, you know, and it's like <laughs> just, just really stupid insults. And then it evolved. And then when, uh, when we decided to do it, we said, okay, let's, let's do one where, you know, each guy in the band is, is talking about what he hates about the other guy. Right. <laughs> so, so, and we had a blast. It was, it was nothing but fun. Bob Ezrin was in on it, of course. And, uh, and we knocked it out. Yeah. I play guitar on it, by the way. Oh, wow. Yeah. I played, I played, uh, the owner of the studio had a guitar, uh, like Glenn Buxton's, uh, a white SG. And he had bought that because he was, he loved Glenn Buxton. And so I said, well, can I borrow that? You know, it's sure, sure. Let's <laughs> tweak it up, put some new strings on it. And, and then next thing I know, I'm, I'm showing the guitar part to Michael and Bob's like, Hey, why don't you record, uh, lay down a track? Okay, cool. <laughs> Michael, I'm stealing your gig. It's <laughs> yeah, I'm a yeah. guitar player now. <laughs> well, Michael plays on it as well. So we, you know, you know, Alice, the more guitars, the merrier. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you brought up earlier, I kind of want to get into also what you've been doing recently. And I know that you brought up uh, Cold Cold Coffin, which is something that you uh, have done recently, um, that film. So if you uh, want to describe a little bit about what, what, that, what that is and uh, what that process was like to those who may not be 100% familiar with it. Well, it began with a song that I wrote for Alice called Cold Cold Coffin. And uh, <clears throat> then I just played it for a friend who's in film, but I, I just played it for him as a friend. Hey, here's a song I wrote today, you know, and listen to this. And, uh, and he's like, that has to be, we have to make that into a film. Peter Perenia is his name. Him and his son, Orion, were, I was at their house. And they're like, no, we got to make a film out of this. And I'm like, oh, oh, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we were going to just knock out a, a music video, but as things started to progress, we started bringing in more people and we started needing this castle for a location and we needed, and next thing you know, it turned into quite the production. And uh, I, I did a Kickstarter campaign and uh, all kinds of fans uh, donated. And I had, you know, I had like uh, uh, some things in storage, like uh, 1972 tour booklets from the Alice Cooper group. And things like that. <clears throat> so I had a lot of items that uh, when you donate, then you get that. And uh, including this uh, record that I talked about, the 12 inch final, which is coming out. That'll, that'll be a uh, Chris Penn from Good Records to Go in Dallas is helping me with that. And he's the best. But <clears throat> so now, okay, the, the theme of the film, which you can see on YouTube, just look up Cold Cold Coffin. The theme is 
I play an older eccentric who owns this castle and uh, my life isn't total reality, but you know, it's kind of a fantasy world. And then this young wife marries me and we're in love. And I say, you know, when I die, all of this is yours. But when the doctors tell me I'm going to die, I see that she's happy about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, wait a minute. So then I, I, have the, uh, I have my body cryogenically frozen in a glass coffin. And I'm in the living room of this gigantic castle. And Calico plays the young gold digger wife. And she's, she's living there with me in the room. And, and she's waiting for me to die. And I'm waiting for her to die. And <laughs> <laughs> and and of course, you know, how did we uh, cast Calico? I mean, we're uh, New York City has all kinds of dancers. You know, we had all these options and stuff. And then I'm thinking, you know what? Wait a minute. I know who could play this part because we had a dance scene. We wanted we wanted a dance scene to happen around the coffin. And uh, of course, Calico was on board. The hard part was just you know scheduling so that when we when we rented this castle we had to make sure that calico didn't have a gig with bisto blanco or whatever and <clears throat> we managed to work it out and it was funny you know calico is the best uh she's so funny and you know we had a scene in the movie where we're getting married right and so we're face to face so the camera is over my shoulder showing her expression and then the camera is over her shoulder showing my expression, right? Well, when when the camera is showing my expression, Calico's crossing her eyes and sticking her tongue out crazy and everything. And I'm trying not to laugh. <laughs> that sounds like, I was going to say, Calico sounded like the perfect choice because she has just enough humor and she's also into, I had her on the podcast not too long ago, she's also into that kind of like dark stuff and, and, and all the darkness and everything everything like that. So she seemed like the perfect choice too. To exactly. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, you know, we did that film and uh, it has won two awards. It won best music video for the Los Angeles Film Festival, uh, Los Angeles Motion Picture Film Festival, and also Shock Fest. So uh, it won, it won two awards. And, uh, you know, we, we tried to do more things with it, but it's hard to commercialize a music video, you know, yeah. unless you're like Beyonce or something, I guess, these days. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, the other film is the uh, Live from the AstroTurf, which we're still hoping will come to light uh, and be available to fans. Uh, that one happened with uh, because of my book, which I see you have behind you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you get, yeah, you get some brownie points for that. <laughs> uh, and uh, hardcover too, it looks like. Yeah, it is a hardcover. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, those, those disappeared overnight. All of a sudden, they became impossible for me to get a hold of. So anyway, this other film was, it was actually a book signing for that book. And it was in Dallas, 2015 in October. And uh, Chris Penn, who I didn't know, you know, all I know is this guy who owns a record store keeps wanting me to do a book signing at his record store. And, and, the, and the publisher is thinking, well, you know, that's, we, we should be doing bookstores and film festivals. You know, this is a record store. How does that work out? Well, he was so persistent. I'm like, okay, let's do it, you know. And he says, well, I have a little stage here in my store and people perform here. Would you, would you perform? I said, yeah, hey, how about, how about if I see if uh, Neil and Michael want to join in? I said, yeah. Well, uh, Chris was up to something that I wasn't totally aware of at the time, but he had already planned out that Alice was going to be in town and have a day off on the day that he uh, – scheduled this thing for. So we got Alice to sneak into the back room. And while Neil and Michael and I were out sitting in electric chairs, signing stuff for fans and doing a QA and a and everything, then we're like, hey, would you like to hear some songs? You know, and in the meantime, I should mention the color of the panties on the, on the book cover. Well, Chris had tracked down AstroTurf that color. So the stage was pink AstroTurf instead of green. <laughs> 
right? <laughs> and the whole the whole store was uh, decorated in uh, with pink uh, trim and everything. Yeah. And he had the balloons and everything else going. So uh, Neil and Michael and I played Caught in a Dream, just the three of us, and everybody was, oh, wow, wow. And then we started Be My Lover, and out came Alice from out of nowhere, and people were like, in shock they're like wait a minute we're in a record store and it's the alice cooper group right so uh uh chris had talked to a friend of his and said hey S steve steve gaddis uh steve you're in film can you bring a camera down here and film this because these guys are my hero and on monday i'm not going to believe it actually happened so the documentation of this <laughs> yeah exactly exactly and so it was supposed to just be something for chris's archives but uh steve got uh some of his other friends down there with cameras and uh and the recording it came out so good the the recording of the music came out really good so then chris got bob ezrin to mix that and and steve was saying you know what you, I think we've got a film here. Well, that film has won a lot of awards, various awards all across the country, Phoenix and Dallas, of course. Uh, even And we've even shown it in London, Hollywood. Oh, man, I can't even think of all the places that we traveled to film festivals for that one. But anyway, so so we're w working on that too. And I'm working on another film now with my band Blue Coop, Joe and Albert Bouchard from Blue Oyster Cult fame. Uh, we're doing an animated film for a song on our new CD 11 even called Jump the Gun. Awesome. Yeah, I know that you guys, uh, back in 2019, you know, when the world was normal and <laughs> live shows were a thing, I know you guys played Sweden Rock Festival, if I'm correct, right? Uh, that was... That's right, with Ryan Roxy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, how was that? Because I know that that this group has been um, a thing for a little while now. You guys obviously put out that record and you play shows all across the country. So how is it to to play that festival? Because, you know, that's a pretty big festival. You know, lots of lots of people flock to that. So what was that like? That, that was the best run festival I've ever seen. I mean, the guys that ran that, every single thing was taken care of. Uh, there were places, just for instance, walking around the festival grounds, you would all of a sudden there would be a little wooden bridge and there's no water but that was it in case it rained wow that that would be needed <laughs> stuff like that every single thing uh i love that festival it was four days and there was a lot of people there that that uh should have uh used some more uh you know sunburn lotion <laughs> <laughs> people that have no shirts and their backs were totally burnt uh but four days you know and there was all kinds of top bands but we were the final band of oh four. wow so so and we followed uh i think uh deep purple or richie blackmore i think yeah and and so we were on the stage there were four stages so we were on the stage that was at behind the audience that was watching rainbow and so another band had canceled so so i told the festival guys and blue coop decided okay we're not going to start until they're done over there and so we timed it just right as soon as deep purple was was finished and then all of the audience you could tell people were just ready to go out the exit which was right uh, near our stage and they were walking toward the exit, and we kicked in with Cities on Flame with rock and roll, you know. And uh, all of a sudden, the whole crowd just turned and came right over in front of our stage, and, <laughs> and it worked out perfectly. Uh, we love that festival. There's actually, uh, we filmed the whole thing. Yeah, you can go on Joe Bichard's uh, channel, YouTube channel, and see it. But Ryan Roxy, that was great, you know, because he lives in Sweden. Yeah, he's a Sweden guy. <laughs> yeah, therefore, for some reason, the festival has a thing about using, uh, you know, other bands, not necessarily Swedish musicians, right? But we found a loophole. He's sitting in with us. So <laughs> uh, that, then that was great. Of course, uh, the tricky part there is that when Ryan is playing certain Alice Cooper songs with Alice, 
he might be playing the uh, Glenn Buxton part or the Michael Bruce part. And with Blue Coop, then Joe plays certain parts. So they had to kind of work that out where now right. Ryan is playing. Uh, same thing happened at the thing in Dallas, actually, uh, uh, where he had to work out with Michael. Okay, Michael, normally I play your part. So now all of a sudden on the drop of a dime, I have to play Glenn's parts. But uh He's great. All of those, all of those uh, people in Alice's band are great. So it wasn't a, much of a problem. And you guys, I know you, like you said, you released that album, um, uh, Eleven Even. And are you guys working on any new music right now? I mean, I know that you're always songwriting, so I'm sure that there are some songs in the works that might end up on something in the future. But is there anything that you guys are planning to put together, uh, you know, sometime soon? Well, uh, for Blue Coop, we're doing a thing on... Uh, if you looked up, you know, Sylvain Sylvain of the New yes. York Dolls recently yeah. passed away. So all of his friends, uh, and there's a lot of them because he was a good guy. He reminded me of Glenn Buxton, actually. He's a sweetheart of a guy. But uh, all of the people in New York City, Tish and Snooky, uh, who have Manic Panic, the hair dye company, but they are singers. They sing uh, er everything with Blue Coop. Every, pretty much everything I do these days is a Tish and Snooky sing on. But we did, we made a music video that will be shown at that, uh, it'll be a, a, a virtual show, even though certain bands in New York City will be playing at Bowery Electric, which is one block away from where CBGB was. Uh, and that'll be on Sunday. If somebody wants to go to my Facebook page, uh, Dennis Dunaway, uh, you, can, uh, you can find where to get tickets for it. It's like $15 and it's got David Johansson, Debbie Harry, uh, all kinds of people like that. Uh, but we did a song called Pills which the New York Dolls did, which Bo Diddley wrote, of all people. <laughs> and uh, that came out good. So that's also Peter Perenni, the same guy that did the Cold Cold Coffin, is the guy that's uh, editing that together for us. Uh, so we're doing that. Uh, I'm also writing, you know, whenever you work with Alice, there's a shroud of secrecy. <laughs> You know, I'm not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're always working on something, though. I can say that. And uh, we're on this something uh, right now as of just, uh, I just sent it to him yesterday. The, I, sent, I sent him a song and he says, oh, yeah, I like this, except uh, can you change the intro and can you change that? And I'm like, sure you know, I'll get back to you. And then I change it and send it back. And so we're doing stuff like that. And it's, and it's always exciting because him and I, I know his taste and he knows mine. And so the, uh, there's not that much discussion uh, where I've worked with other musicians that we didn't have that long history with. Yeah. And there's a lot of explaining, especially if you do things online, you know. That's the good thing about the Blue Coop album. You know, we were together 11 years. That's why it's called 11 Even. Yeah. And it has 10 songs. But if you wait 11 seconds, there's an 11th song. Jump the gun, which is the video is going to be. But we did that whole album all in the same room together. There was no sending demos back and forth like our previous two albums. So uh, I just love music and and. I have a lot of great musical friends that are very talented. And uh, that's, that's what Cindy and I love about, you know, our, our life really is because kindred spirits out there, you know, and we, uh, you know, you're talking about Calico, you know, how many people could I say, okay, well, uh, we're going to do this movie where I'm in a coffin. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and with her, it's like, you don't even have to explain it, you know? It's yeah, like, she's like, yeah, I'm in. Don't, don't even, you don't even have to finish your sentence. I will do it. <laughs> yeah, well, T Tish and Snooky are like that, too. I have some pretty abstract ideas in my songwriting. And when I go to explain it to them, it's like, boom, they're right on the same page. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, especially with Alice, too. I mean, you guys built your entire career off of being abstract and unique and and doing things that nobody else would think about doing. So it's worked out pretty well for you guys so far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's it's really is the, uh, uh, I'm saying American dream, but it's 
really is the teenager's dream. You know, if you're, you know, little girls back then would be a ballerina and, and little boys would want to play football or be a music, a rock star, right? And we, we met, you know, Alice was 15 and I was 16. And we, you know, you, that letter, you know, is pretty, you can tell we were just kids. If you read that letter, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, sophomoric, I guess. But we got this dream. Okay, we're going to start a band and we're going to incorporate artistic ideas into it. And then we talked other people into doing that. And then we talked other people into dressing crazy and, and, and everybody, you know, what are the odds that we would have five musicians in a band that would all agree to, to, to do a song called BB on Mars? You know, it's, it, it really was, you know, once, once Neil and once Michael and everybody uh, uh, kind of saw this vision, then we all moved forward and everybody uh, put in as much creativity and hard work as the next guy. And we didn't let anything get in the way, you know, same with Joe and Shep, uh, our managers, you know, it's like, Throwing in the towel was not, you know, it's no rear view mirror. We're, we're moving ahead. I think some of that was because Alice and I ran long distance, you know, cross country and stuff. It's like you just keep going no matter what. Uh, but that's what we did. And so here's these high school kids with this dream. And we took it all the way to number one in the UK and, and the United States. So I achieved my dream, really. You know, nobody can feel sorry for me. Yeah. I mean, I, and you look back on that, it's, it's really, I mean, you guys, and I always say this because I also, I mean, I love the Alice Cooper band. It's just, to me, you guys started that entire movement that came after, you know, that the, the whole kiss thing and, and all, everything that kind of continued, you know, you guys, to me, were the very beginning. I mean, nobody else was, nobody else was doing all that stuff. And you guys are really the innovators, you know, from the makeup to the, the outfits and, and to everything that you guys were doing. So I mean, I, I love I love the work that you've done. I've been a huge fan for for many years. So I'm uh, I'm glad to hear that you went forward and didn't let anything stop you because you definitely uh, achieved the dream. And I mean, like you said, it's 40 years later. It's 50 years later, and people are still, you know, flocking to hear hear these songs. So yeah, well, thank God for that. And you know, and I think a lot of that has to do. You're talking about being at, in the audience of Alice's show with your parents. You know, uh, I started doing these uh, monster conventions and stuff where they would have celebrities that would meet fans and, and sign things for them. And it seemed like when I first started doing them, which was maybe in the 80s or something like that, uh, you would have uh, parents bringing a kid to meet me, right? And the kid obviously looked like they had something better to do, you know, <laughs> and then, and then it changed. It's like, you know, uh, 10 years after that, all of a sudden, because of schools out, you know, there would be a kid that brought his parents and they look like, oh boy, you know, who's this guy, you know, <laughs> but that's, that's the great thing. I mean, thank God for schools out for that. I'm 18 too in the Midwest, but you know, it's like uh, there's little kids uh, everywhere that the last day of school, they hear our song. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's I grew up just listening to this type of music. My parents were big rock fans. And I mean, I uh, heard Alice Cooper for the first time and I was very young. I was like eight or nine. And I just I it just something clicked in me. And it's kind of taken me on this journey of kind of where I am now and, and doing journalism and kind of getting to the music industry. So it definitely clicks and I'm not the only one, you know, I know a lot of, I know a lot of people in my age group who are into this music and, you know, feel the same way about you guys and other bands. And uh, it's, it's great. I mean, I love seeing that, you know, I guess I'm one of them, but you know, people continuing on and kind of carrying the torch and, you know, like, like I said, it's 50 years later and, you know, you can go to Jones beach and there's, you know, it's sold out. You know, it's, it's insane. It's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, we still got a long way to go, you know. <laughs> uh, and before I let you go, at the end of every single one of my interviews, I ask kind of like five rapid fire almost questions. I mean, you can explain them if you'd like. They're, uh, they're not too long or too crazy. Um, I call them the metal from the inside five. So the first one is if you weren't in the profession that you're currently in, so obviously musician, songwriter, uh, bass player, what do you think that you would be doing? 
I would probably be an artist. I might be a writer, uh, something artistic. Yeah. I mean, I th- obviously, I think you have a, a lot of creativity, so it would be something probably in that realm for sure. Well, that's what I would like to be doing. Not, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, not everybody gets to have a job that's what the, something that they love. But if you can do that, then, you know, that, that makes a whole different in, in, difference in your life. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, the second question is, what is something that you wish everybody knew about you? So like, whether that's a secret talent, do you have like a guilty pleasure, something that uh, not a lot of people might know? You know, people should know that if they say if uh, they wanted to get some information out of me that I didn't want to give them, all they have to do is set a big bowl of popcorn in front of me, <laughs> just out of my reach. <laughs> I'll talk. <laughs> Uh, number three, uh, if you were stranded on a desert island, the age old question, and uh, you could only bring three records with you uh, to listen to, what would they be? Okay, well, the question is, would I have a record player and electricity? Uh, hopefully. <laughs> in, in, in a perfect world, you would. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, uh, all right. Well, I would maybe bring albums or just songs? Albums. Uh, okay, I would maybe bring uh, Astral Weeks, uh, Van Morrison. I love that album. Uh, I might bring something by uh, Free, maybe. I might bring something by uh, Elvis, maybe. Or maybe, uh, uh, maybe uh, what is the ACDC live album with the uh, whole lot of Rosie? <laughs> Oh man! Yeah, yeah I, I could I could sit there with sharks sharks going around the <laughs> island and da 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 da. I always joke around. I'm like in an I an ideal situation, there'd be somebody else on the the island that you could barter records with and change it up every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you could put it on a little raft and send it away, and something else would come back. Yeah, message in a bottle. Please send more records. Three is not enough. <laughs> yeah, it's, and the other side of the question is, like, uh, if you had your favorite album of all time, and that's the only one that you could listen to, how long would it still be your favorite? <laughs> that's what somebody I had on, a, I forget who said this on the podcast, said uh, that they would bring an album that actually wasn't probably one of their favorites so that they would grow to love it because you know it's at first yeah it's like I'll bring my favorite and then you're like I've already heard this album so many times I mean it's it's my favorite but you might as well bring something I haven't heard you know (laughs) you know uh yeah probably going with uh you know Beethoven or something would might be a good idea (laughs) (laughs) uh the fourth question is what is one piece of advice that you would give to your younger self if you could Oh my God. Um, to, okay, this is, this is one of my regrets uh, working with the Alice Cooper group because I was so driven and so the crusader for making everything better all the time. Glenn Buxton called me the pest, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, I would say, uh, be, and, and generally the whole band did this where we would, if somebody brought a song to the table, we would, oh, this, let's change this. Let's make this better. Let's make that better. And let's make that better. And, and when the song got to the level where nobody could think of anything that we could add to it to make it better, then that was the end of it. You know, and that's my regret. I never said, great job. Now we got it. That's excellent. Right. Way to go. Cool part. You know, nobody did that. We didn't. We didn't. It's just like uh, when think when you got everybody to shut up, then that meant it was good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you're in the middle of doing it, and believe me, I'm a perfectionist too. It's, it's, it's hard to be like, wow, that was, that's really good. You know, you're still like, there must be something else that I can do to, to make this, you know, some, something else, you know, it's that's hard it. to. It's hard that's to it. appreciate it sometimes. <laughs> you you just hit the nail on the head. That's that's probably what it was. We were all, uh, you know, just perfectionists to where even when it got to where we wanted it to go, you still thought there must be yeah. something. Yeah. Well, they ended up being uh, pretty pretty damn good, even though uh, even though at the time you thought that <laughs> something else had to be added. So. <laughs> well, um, the you know, and then after all that work and all of that uh, critical analysis and everything that went on you hear it back after you finish recording it and especially if you had a a 
a space of time after you got out of the studio and gave it a, a rest for a while. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you heard it on the radio or something. You go, wow, you know, hey, we did pretty good, I guess. <laughs> That's actually really good. Yeah, a lot better than I remember when I was doing it. <laughs> Uh, the last question I have for you is more of a fun one. Um, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Any superpower? Oh, my God. Uh, okay, I'll go with superpower. Yipes. <laughs> uh, oh, boy. I would like to... Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this as a superpower. I'd like to play guitar like Jimi Hendrix. That's a superpower. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I want that superpower too. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty yeah, good. Who, yeah. who doesn't, right? <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your afternoon to come on the podcast. Like I said, I've loved your music for many years. So it was an honor to have you on. And I'm excited to see everything that you have in the works uh, film wise. And of course, you know, music wise in the future with, you know, Blue Coop and Alice. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sydney. Of course.